chapter of John and Adam against the Board of Trustees of the Tay Gallery. Lord Leggett will explain the decision of the court. For centuries, the common law of nuisance has protected homeowners from activities of neighbours which unduly interfere with the ordinary use and enjoyment of their homes. A typical case of nuisance is the neighbour who repeatedly plays loud music late at night, or a nearby factory which emits unpleasant fumes. But nuisances can take many different forms. In this case, unusually, the nuisance alleged takes the form of visual intrusion, that is to say, people constantly looking into the claimant's homes. The claim was brought by the owners of four flats in a block on the south bank of the Thames in London. The flats are high above ground level. The two most affected are on the 18th and 19th floors. A feature of the flats is that the walls are made mainly of glass. The block of flats is located next to the Tate Modern Art Museum, which in 2016 opened a new extension called the Blavatnik Building. This building is 10 storeys high, and on its top floor has a viewing platform from which visitors can enjoy panoramic views of London. On the south side of the viewing platform, visitors can see directly into the claimant's flats. The claimants applied to the High Court for an injunction to require the Tate to prevent visitors from viewing their flats from the platform. At the time of the trial, the viewing platform was open every day of the week, all year round, and was attracting over half a million visitors a year. The judge found on the evidence at the trial that a very significant number of visitors display an interest in the interiors of the claimant's flats. Some look, some peer, some take photographs, some wave. Occasionally binoculars are used. Many photographs have been posted online. The judge found that this level of viewing and interest shown in the claimant's flats is a material intrusion into the privacy of their homes, using the word privacy in its everyday sense. But he dismissed the claim. In essence, his reasons were that the Tate's use of the top floor of its building as a public viewing platform was reasonable, and that the claimants had exposed themselves to view by choosing to live in properties with glass walls. The judge also thought that the claimants could reasonably be, be expected to protect their own privacy by taking measures such as drawing their blinds during the day or installing net curtains. The claimants appealed to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal decided that the judge had not applied the law correctly, and that if the general principles of the law of nuisance are correctly applied, the claim should succeed. But they dismissed the appeal. They did so on the ground that what they referred to as overlooking cannot in law give rise to a claim in nuisance, no matter how oppressive it may be. From that decision, the claimants have appealed to the Supreme Court. By a majority of three to two, we allow the appeal. I, Lord Leggett, give the majority judgment with which Lord Reid and Lord Lloyd-Jones agree. Lord Sales gives a dissenting judgment with which Lord Kitchen agrees. All five of us agree that the ground on which the Court of Appeal decided the case was wrong and that visual intrusion is in principle capable of being a nuisance. It is true that the mere fact that one building overlooks another cannot give rise to a claim, but that is not the complaint made here. The complaint is that the Tate invites visitors to look out from a viewing platform from which they can, and many do, peer into the claimant's flats and allows this activity to continue without interruption day in, day out. There is no reason in principle why visual intrusion of this kind cannot give rise to liability for nuisance. And the majority of the court considers that it does in this case. In my judgment, I review the principles of the law of nuisance. Key points are that to give rise to a claim, the activity complained about must interfere with the ordinary use and enjoyment of the claimant's property and the interference must be one that the ordinary person would regard as substantial. 
Even then, no claim could be made if the defendant is doing no more than making a common and ordinary use of its own land. What constitutes an ordinary use of land has to be judged taking account of the character of the locality, for example, whether it is a residential or an industrial area. Applying these principles, I conclude in my judgment that on the facts found by the judge, this is a clear case of nuisance. The judge found that the claimant's flats are under near constant observation by visitors to the Tate's viewing platform. There are hundreds of thousands of visitors each year, and many take photographs. The ordinary person would consider this level of intrusion to be a substantial interference with the ordinary use and enjoyment of their home. By contrast, the judge found that making a viewing gallery available to members of the public is not an activity which should actually be expected, even in a part of London used partly for cultural purposes and which attracts tourists. The judge went wrong, first of all, by asking whether in operating the viewing platform the Tate was making an unreasonable use of its land, instead of asking whether it was a common and ordinary use. If he'd asked himself whether it was a common and ordinary use, he would have been bound to conclude that it was not. Next, as I've mentioned, the judge thought that the claimants had exposed themselves to view by choosing to live in flats with glass walls. Again, the nature of the use which the Tate is making of its land is important. <clears throat> if, for example, another high-rise block of flats had been built on the Tate's land, from which residents looking out of their windows could see into the claimants' homes, the claimants could not have complained about the fact that the interiors of their flats could be seen because of the glass walls. But it's different where, as here, the Tate is using its land not in an ordinary way, but in an abnormal way, not reasonably to be expected. Here, it's no answer to a claim for nuisance to say that the claimants would not have suffered a nuisance if their homes had been designed or built differently. As for the argument that the claimants could reasonably be expected to shield themselves from view by drawing their blinds or putting up net curtains, that argument wrongly places the responsibility to avoid the consequences of the nuisance on the victim. As the judge himself pointed out, it's not an answer to a complaint of excessive noise to say that the victim should buy earplugs. As I've said, Lord Sales and Lord Kitchen take a different view and would have dismissed the appeal. I cannot, in this very short summary, do justice to their reasons. But they consider, first, that the judge rightly applied a test of asking what is objectively reasonable, rather than focusing on whether the Tate's use of its land is an ordinary use. And second, that the judge was better placed than an appeal court to apply this test, and did not, in their view, make any error of law in doing so. The appeal to this court was limited to whether the Tate is liable for nuisance and did not include the question of what remedy should be ordered if the appeal succeeds. The appeal has succeeded. The court holds that the Tate is liable to the claimants under the law of nuisance. To decide on the appropriate remedy, the case will be sent back to the High Court. The court will now adjourn.